Hi, everybody. Welcome to the session story time with Lisa Suhair Majaj. We are going to start in just a couple of minutes. Um, I see people joining now. Welcome, everybody. We are going to start the session in just a couple of minutes. My name is um, Sausan, and I'm here with Lisa Suhair Majaj, our author. And if you like, maybe you can tell us where you are logging in from. For example, I'm in Baltimore, Maryland, and um, you'll be interested to know where Lisa is. She'll tell you in the chat in a second, but maybe you can tell us where you're logging in from. This um, festival has been, we have 2,600 people from all over the world, from 70 different countries. I see Champaign, Illinois, London, Philadelphia. Philadelphia is my hometown. Oh, and there's a fellow uh, Cypri out there, Lisa, someone is. Oh, Yota, hi Yota. Okay, great. <laughs> I just now figured out how to look at the attendees, <laughs> okay. Well, they're just uh, typing in the chat for you to okay. let me know. Oh, Beirut. We have uh, Sarah in Beirut, Sarah's in Beirut. I'm not seeing this. Okay. Yeah. We are going to give you a chance, everyone, to put your cameras on later and talk to Lisa. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about her book, just a couple, of, a minute or two, and then she's going to read you the story. And after she reads the story, we'll have time to um, talk to her and ask questions. Hello, Connecticut and Massachusetts and oh, Asheville, North Carolina. North Carolina is a beautiful town. I've been there. I'm seeing some friends. Hello, hello. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Ruth. Hi, Nadine. Oh, oh Nadia Aburish is here. My favorite teacher in the state of Virginia. There she is. She's a great, great, great person. Welcome, everybody. This is kind of amazing, actually, that we have this technology. Isn't Even it? It would have been nice to be in New York, but. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. You know, we reach everyone in the diaspora, 70 countries. It's amazing. It's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So everybody, um, welcome to the session. I'm going to do a very, uh, this is my running joke all weekend, which is I'm going to do a very non-Arab thing, which is I'm going to start the session on time. So we're going to actually be on time. <laughs> That's been my constant joke all, all weekend. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that joke all the time. So um, welcome, everybody. My name is Sosan Maadi Daraj. I am thrilled to be with you today uh, to present uh, Lisa Suhair Mejaj, who is logging in to join us from Cyprus. She has a wonderful children's book, among many other works, and she's going to share that book with us today. Let me tell you a little bit about Lisa. Lisa Suhair Mejaj is the author of the children's book, Naila, Sh Naila Shares a Story. It's about a Palestinian child from Jordan who moves to the US with her family. Lisa is also the author of the prize-winning poetry volume, Geographies of Light, and of poetry and prose in journals and anthologies across the US, the Middle East, Europe, and India. She has co-edited three collections of critical essays on Arab, Arab American, and international women's writing. Her writing has been used in various non-literary venues, including the 2016 photography exhibition Aftermath, The Fallout of War, America and the Middle East, which appeared at the Harn Museum of Art, the University of Florida, and she has been translated into several languages, including Arabic and Greek. She lives in Cyprus, as I said. And Lisa, it's a real joy to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Can you hold, do you have the book to hold up for us if people can? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the book and how you came to write it? Yeah, it was just completely fortuitous. I got an email from um, Sandia Nankani of, of an organization called Literary Safari. And she said that Naomi Shihab Nye had given her my name. And they were looking for authors to write diverse children's books for an educational press called Benchmark Education. So that's how it started. And they were quite specific. I mean, it wasn't that, to be very honest, they said, we want a book about an immigrant child from the Middle East who comes to the States. 
and adjusts. So I was given the basic um, format and I had to work with the press around their needs. But I was then able to, I'd been, I'd been thinking about writing children's books for a while. I'd been working on a children's magazine for a while. It was mainly health and science, but we had written some stories about Arab and Islamic historical figures. And I have, uh, I had a draft of a children's book stuck in a drawer that I hadn't finished and I still haven't finished it, but I will. Um, but so this was actually kind of exciting. And it also gave me the opportunity to draw on my personal experiences a little bit. And I, I did, I can talk more about that after I read the book, but I did manage to bring some aspects of my own life into the story. So it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. So, yeah. That's exciting. Um, That's wonderful. Yeah. Would yeah. you read it for us? Sure. Great. So Nyla shares a story and it's a chapter book. So it's in four chapters. The first one is called Leaving Jordan. Yalla, time to go. Nyla hears her mother calling. She takes one last unhappy look around the bedroom she has been sharing with her little sister. It isn't fair, Nyla mutters to herself. I don't want to leave this country. I don't want to leave Jordan. Through the window, she can see the orange tree her father planted last year. There are small oranges on it. She won't even be able to taste the fruit when it becomes ripe. Nyla sighs, flips her brown hair behind her, and goes out to the main room. Nyla's grandmother calls her over. Come here, Habibti, my love. Nyla's grandmother, Teta Noor, is dressed in her best clothes. She's wearing her special necklace, the one with the noon, the Arabic letter N. The noon is for her first name, Noor, which means light. Yes, Teta. As she walks toward her beloved grandmother, Nyla remembers how she used to sit on Teta's lap, playing with the pendant while Teta told her stories. Nyla loves Teta's stories. Her favorite is the one about the time Teta was milking the family goat and it kicked over the pail and ran away. After that, I learned to always tie a goat when you're milking, unless you want milk all over you as you chase a runaway goat, Teta used to say. Nyla even loves Teta's sad stories like when Teta had to come to Jordan from Palestine because of the war in 1948 and couldn't go home again. Teta gets a faraway look in her eyes when she talks about the stone house she had to leave, the one with the fig tree outside. Now Teta fumbles with the chain of her pendant. Next thing Nyla knows, Teta's necklace is around her own neck. Teta cups her palms gently around Nyla's face. Ya Amar, Ya Rohi, my moon, my soul. This is my special present to you. I want you to take this necklace with you to America. Nyla looks solemnly at her grandmother. She knows this is an important moment. Her grandmother says, you know that the letter Noon is for my name. It's also for your name, Nyla. Nyla nods. Nyla is a special name. It means generosity, like when the moon shines in the dark, sharing its light. Teta sighs and then continues. You must go and shine in the United States. Don't forget to share the special things about you with the people you meet. If you feel lonely or scared, touch the noon and remember that I love you. Nyla hugs her grandmother tightly. Then Nyla's mother says, Yalla, time to get in the car, we're late. Nyla pulls Teta Noor by the hand toward the door. The whole family is going to the airport with them. Nyla doesn't have to say goodbye yet. That's one thing she's glad about. Chapter two in America. Nyla jabs her pencil into the worksheet for her history homework. Enough already, she whispers to herself. She's sitting at the kitchen table trying to study. Nyla doesn't mind doing math, that's easy. They are doing things she did last year in school, but the English. Welcome to the show, kids. Today we're going to learn. Nyla covers her ears. It's hard to concentrate with her little sister's TV show blasting in the background and her mother chatting with Mrs. Dalton, their neighbor. No, no, you need to grind the chickpeas first for falafel. For two whole months, they've been living squeezed into her aunt and uncle's apartment in Detroit, Michigan. It hasn't been easy. Nyla looks at her homework again and tries to concentrate. She learned English in Jordan, but most of her subjects were taught in Arabic. 
She's finding it hard to study everything in a different language. And sometimes she misses things because she can't understand the teacher's accent. Nyla turns back to her history worksheet on the United States Civil War. She writes, the color of the Confederate soldiers' uniforms was gray while the Union soldiers wore blue. She groans with frustration as she crosses out color, C-O-L-O-U-R, and replaces it with color, C-O-L-O-R, and changes gray, G-R-E-Y, to G-R-A-Y. In Jordan, they use British English, but American spelling is different. Nyla has to remember not to put a U in words like color and favor, or the teacher will mark them wrong. In the next room, Nyla hears her mother say, I'm getting worried. Nyla holds her breath to hear better. She tries to listen over her sister's TV show. There's a lot to be worried about. Nyla thinks about how her father is working extra hours to cover expenses. Meanwhile, her mother, who was a successful teacher in Jordan, can't seem to get an interview. The voices from the next room get softer. Nyla strains to hear. The teacher says she never speaks in class never raises her hand, doesn't play with anyone at recess. Now Nyla knows her mother is talking about her. It's true. At school, she mostly tries to pretend she isn't there at all. On her first day, some of the kids asked her questions that made her feel sure she'd never fit in. Did you ride a camel to go places? Did you live in a tent? Have you ever seen a bus before? They weren't trying to be mean, but they didn't understand anything about her or her country. Thinking about that terrible first day still makes Nyla's chest hurt. It feels like she's drowning. Mrs. Dalton, their neighbor, is talking now. What about an outside activity? There's a wonderful group called Confident Girls. My granddaughters go and they love it. Nyla cringes. Things are bad enough. Now I have to join group activities too? Nyla doesn't like being in big groups. She's much happier playing with her cousins or spending time alone with her drawing pad and her books. Once her parents had tried to get her to join a club in Jordan. Her mother had said, but you'll get to go on picnics and outings. Nyla had wondered to herself, why aren't family picnics enough? Nyla thinks about the night picnic they went on at the Dead Sea shortly before leaving Jordan. The air was dry and smelled like salt. She and her cousins floated on top of the dense water, giggling. They knew to be careful not to splash or get the salty water into their eyes. They stayed in the water so long that their bodies felt oily with salt. When they finally got out of the water, their parents had a delicious smelling barbecue waiting for them. Remembering that special night makes Nyla feel calmer. She pushes aside her history homework for her drawing pad. She draws a quick sketch of the moon shining over the Dead Sea. She adds the moon's reflection floating on the water below. Chapter three, Confident Girls. It takes weeks, but Nyla's mother finally convinces her to go to a meeting for Confident Girls. As Nyla walks into the room, she feels her chest get tight. She looks around. The room is filled with 20 girls all talking to each other. They all seem like good friends. Nyla doesn't know a single person. Welcome, Nyla, come sit, says the leader of the group, Mrs. Garcia. Nyla hurries to the closest folding chair as Mrs. Garcia places a globe on a table. Girls, let's welcome Nyla to our group. Nyla lived in Jordan before she moved here. Who wants to show us where Jordan is on the globe? Nyla isn't surprised when no one responds. Luckily, Mrs. Garcia doesn't ask her to stand up in front of everyone and point out Jordan. It's here in the Middle East, you see? Mrs. Garcia says, her finger pointing to the globe. It's near Syria, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. We've been hearing a lot about Syria in the news. Nyla feels her face get hot. She hopes no one is looking at her. She notices a table next to her with a tub of hummus and some carrot sticks. Without thinking, she dips a carrot stick into the hummus and says aloud, this is like what my mother makes at home. The girl next to her smiles and says, cool. We eat hummus at home too, but my mom just buys it at the supermarket. Nyla looks at her surprised. After a boy at school made fun of her Zatar pita roll-ups, calling them dirt sandwiches, Nyla asked her mother for lunch money instead. But her mother said money was too tight. 
Now Nyla gets up early to make cold cheese sandwiches for herself before her mother gets to the kitchen. Nyla chews quietly, looking downward. Luckily, Mrs. Garcia puts away the globe and starts talking about the day's activities. Today, we'll be practicing the narration for our multimedia projects, and in a couple of weeks, we'll begin taping your stories. Remember, multimedia means you should use more than one form of storytelling, like videos, music, slideshows, drawings. Does anyone want to share the story she's chosen? The girl next to Nyla waves her hand. Mrs. Garcia nods. Please come to the front, Eileen. The, girls, the girl moves forward and turns to face the group. In a strong voice, she begins, so this one time my dad went fishing on the lake near my grandparents' house. Nyla listens, her heart sinking. How on earth am I going to be able to tell a story in front of a group of people I don't know? Why did I agree to do this? They're doing story projects, Nyla says to her mother that night. I have to think of a story. Then I have to tell it in front of all these people and they'll film it. I can't do this. Nyla feels her face getting warm. Her mother puts an arm around her. One thing at a time. First, tell me what kinds of stories the other kids are doing. Well, one girl's story is about catching a fish so big it pulled her father into the water, Nyla says. She holds up her arms to show her mother the size of the fish. Nyla's mother nods her head. That's a good story. What else? Someone is going to talk about her vacation in the Ozark Mountains, wherever that is, Nyla continues. There's a girl who's going to talk about making something called a green bean casserole. She makes it every year for a holiday called Thanksgiving. I think she's going to show how to make it. And another girl is going to tell a funny story her dad tells all the time. Nyla's mother nods. Sounds like they're talking about their family experiences, her mother says. It's a nice way to get to know people. What if someone here, Mrs. Dalton, for instance, asked you for a story like that? What would you tell her? Nyla thinks, I could tell about our night picnic at the Dead Sea, she says, when we floated on the water and had a barbecue. Nyla and her mother both smile. Or I could tell about the time we went to Petra and rode camels down into the sea and saw the sandstone buildings carved into the rock. I'll bet no one knows that an Indiana Jones movie was filmed there. Good. Anything else? Nyla ponders. I could tell about how we make mamul for holidays, how the cookies look like little moons with the powdered sugar on top. Her mother nods and says, those are good ideas. Why don't you think about it for a few days before you decide? At bedtime, Nyla lies watching the moon shining through a tree outside her window, just like it used to peek through the leaves of her orange tree at home. It is so strange to go halfway around the world and find something familiar, Nyla thinks. Their first night in the United States, Nyla's little sister looked up sleepily and exclaimed, they have a moon here too, it's just like our moon. Everyone had laughed at that. In Arabic, the word for moon is Amar. Nyla can still feel Tayta Noor cupping her face the day they left. She can almost hear the words as if Tayta Noor is in the room. Ya Amar, Ya Rohi, my moon, my soul. Nyla opens the drawer next to her bed and pulls out the necklace from Tata Noor. She touches the gold noon. I wish Tata were here to tell me a bedtime story the way she used to. Tata's stories often featured a man called Joha. Nyla still isn't sure whether Joha was real or made up, but she loved to listen to the funny things he did. Then an idea comes to Nyla. I'll tell a story about Joha, Nyla thinks. Tata Noor would love that. But which one should I choose? Chapter four, saving the moon. The sweat from Nyla's palms is seeping into her drawing pad. She is standing in front of the room of girls. She's been practicing for two weeks, but her throat is dry and she doesn't feel the slightest bit ready. Nyla's mother smiles at her from a front row seat. She has her phone out waiting to start recording. Nyla fingers the gold noon around her neck. She wishes Tata Noor were in the audience. Then she takes a deep breath and begins. Joha is someone known all over the Middle East where I am from. 
People say he did lots of funny things and they love to tell stories about him. This is my grandmother's favorite Jaha story. It's about the time Jaha saved the moon from drowning. One night, Jaha could not sleep. It was summer and he was hot and thirsty, but the jug in the kitchen was empty. If he wanted a drink, he would have to pull up water from the well. Jaha sighed and got up. He put on his sandals, pushed open the door and walked across the courtyard to the well. He picked up the bucket tied to the long rope and leaned over to drop it into the opening. Then Jaha gasped. There at the bottom of the well was the moon. Somehow the moon had fallen into the well. Jaha was terrified. The moon would drown down there. He had to save her. Quickly, Jaha dropped the bucket into the well. He started moving the rope this way and that, trying to catch the moon in the bucket. But no matter what he did, he couldn't get hold of the moon. Then the rope got caught on something on the side of the well. Suddenly, the rope snapped. Jaha fell backward onto the ground. As he lay there trying to catch his breath, he looked up into the sky. There was the moon shining in the sky above him. Jaha was thrilled that the moon hadn't drowned after all. He was so relieved that he didn't think to ask how the moon had climbed back into the sky. He didn't care that his back was sore from the fall and he wasn't thirsty anymore either. He got up and went back across the courtyard to bed, leaving the moon shining in the sky where she belonged. Nyla ends the story, her knees weak with relief. People start clapping. She's done it. Some of the girls even stand and clap. In the car on the way home, Nyla sighs. I wish Tate and Nora could have heard me. We'll send her the video tonight, says her mother, and we'll video chat with her on the weekend. It's too late in Jordan to call her now. She'll be so proud of you. Nyla leans against the window, watching the neighborhood pass by. So many things that once seemed strange are familiar now. Words are still spelled differently, but when she read them out loud, people could still understand her. I'll bet Tata will be happy that Joha traveled all the way to America, Nyla says. Her mother nods. When I was a little girl, Tata Noor used to tell me that stories are better than anything you own because no one can take them away from you and you can carry them with you wherever you go. Nyla thinks about this, remembering what Tata Noor said the day they left Jordan. Don't forget to share the special things about you with the people you meet. Nyla can't wait to go home and write some more stories, this time about her own life. For the first time since coming to the United States, Nyla is excited. The end. <laughs> okay. So. Thank you. Thank you for, for reading that for us. It's always such a wonderful experience to hear the book read by the author. I love that. Thank you. Thank I love you. that. I had a green bean casserole story this past Thanksgiving. I made it for the first time ever. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I had a friend over and she was asking about, are you having green bean casserole? And I said, I don't think I've ever eaten that in my life. I've been in America for 45 years. <laughs> but yeah, so. Um, for Thanksgiving, we would always have garlicky green beans the Arabic way. So <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> for Thanksgiving, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'd like to invite anybody at this point, anybody who would like to join us by turning your camera on and even your microphone to have a discussion. We have about a little, maybe eight or 10 minutes left. Um, make sure your hand is raised and the tech team in Ramallah, we have a wonderful tech team helping us out in Ramallah. They will let you in so we can see you and talk to you and you can ask your questions. So raise your hand if you want to be let in and the team will start working on that. Um, Wafat Hassan is asking in the Q&A where you can buy the book. Uh, I believe the book is in the Palestine Rights um, Bookshop right now. If you go to the information booth yeah. in the lobby area, you will see um, in the lobby, I'm looking for it now so I can give you the link, but if you go to the lobby area, you can see um, the bookshop link and you'll be able to find the book there. I'm looking for it now to make it easier so I can just 
post the link for you. Lisa also has many other books. I actually was introduced to Lisa's work first to her scholarship. So she has some wonderful essays and other scholarly collections that you can um, check out as well. And she has a beautiful book of poems, Geographies of Light. Geographies of Light is available in the bookshop for sure as well. Welcome everybody, Ahmed, Priscilla, Ruth. Thank you for joining us. Does anybody have a question for Lisa or a comment? You can either ask your question or you can type it in the Q&A. Oh, we have some. Okay. Oh, some of the kids are commenting. I, That's nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, how much of the story is based on your own experiences, Lisa? Nancy is asking. Oh, um, you know, because I had the basic trajectory of the story and then I wanted it to be, um, I mean, so the, the main character is like me, but is not me because she's, a, a, she's not American and Palestinian. Um, it, but a lot of the details of the story come from my life in Jordan and the, the, the shock of impact of arriving in the States. Um, I drew on, for that, I drew on my own memories. When I was almost 10, I was in Jordan during Black September. Um, and after the month of September, my um, Black September, when um, the Jordanian army moved to expel the Palestinians and our house was, right in the middle of the fighting. And after a month, my mother took my sister and I to Iowa to stay with our grandfather for a year. And I, my first day at school was is seared into my mind. So the details in the story about um, that, you know, the first experiences at school did come out of my own experiences. And other small details, um, like the orange tree and the night picnic um, in Jordan that came out of a childhood memory. Um, so basically what I did was I just tried to get the texture of, of experiences and the emotional reality. And then I tried to fit it into the, into the framework of the book. Um, and originally I was going to try and um, work with a Palestinian folk tale. And then I didn't find one that seemed suitable. And then I found this Jaha story and I just, I just loved it. Um, and then it just se seemed to fit because I was trying to weave together uh, we have the imagery of the moon and you have the, the idea that the child's name means generosity. And then, you know, Jaha is trying to save the moon from drowning, which is a beautifully generous thing. And so I tried to, I tried to bring these small, these elements together in a, in a subtle way. Um, so, yeah, yeah. We have some comments from some of the children in the audience. I just want to read them to you. Sonia okay. is six and she says it's very beautiful. And, mm -hmm. um, um, Zahra is age four in London, and she says, I like your story. Oh, another, child, so. <laughs> another child is saying the story makes me feel so sad, but so happy at the same time. So um, okay. we have another question for you um, from Zainab. How mm -hmm. is writing for children different from writing for adults? You wrote poetry, nonfiction, memoir. What is the message that you want to tell? And is it creating a collective memory of Palestinians or something else? Okay, great questions. Um, first of all, writing for children is much harder than I thought it was going to be. Much harder, <laughs> way harder. <laughs> so, because you have to do things, um, you have to get a lot into very simple flowing language and you can't really take anything for granted. Um, and I will say that I sort of regretted not having the character um, come to the States from Palestine. Um, and I think if I had were to do it again, I might've framed it that way because I would have liked to have Palestine more present in the book. And I had, there, was, there were more things there that got taken out. I think actually it was more for space reasons than ever, but I, I, than anything else in some ways. But um, I had something about the grandmother having a house key and I had some other things in there, um, but so there isn't, it isn't directly about Palestine, but um, when the mother reminds Naila that her grandmother always says that stories are the, the thing that nobody can take away from you, that for me was very much drawing on the Palestinian experience, um, which I don't expect children to get. But I do think that with children's literature, we can help to convey a collective memory that can be, it, it's through very small things, it's through, 
food and landscape and little things about family structures and just about connection, family connection and love and this sense of a, of a memory and this idea that our stories are something that we can take with us and they link us to our past and they link us to our future. So, um, and I will say that I, I was then asked to write a second book following this. It's not published yet, um, but, um, and that one is, it's again, it's, it's pretty simple. It's, it's more based in the States, but I may be developing this into a novel in which I will try and make it a bit broader. Um, so I'll try and get in more of the background, more of, more of the Palestinian framework as well as the American framework. So, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, uh, it's yeah. not. <laughs> Priscilla has a question. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for being with us, Lisa. Um, I wanted to ask you, when you're, you know, exploring Palestinian narratives and Palestinian themes in the children's publication space, is that more fraught? Is it more welcoming? Um, you know, what was that like? Okay, it was a bit hard for me because I didn't know what I could expect. And because of all my research on Arab American literature and knowing so much about what authors have, have faced, I, um, I was cautious. And um, I didn't know, to be very honest, I didn't know how much scope I could have. And I wanted more than anything to just have another book about an Arab, Arab character with a Palestinian background, that was the most important thing for me. Um, as I said, there were some changes made to the, there were some changes made to the text. Um, and I don't think that they were intentional, but there were changes that I, that I had to work with. Um, and I also, I also realized that it's, it's also very different when you just sit down and write your own book, but when you're writing to meet a particular need, and this is a book that it was intended to go into schools. So then I was trying, and I was asked to, and I was trying to keep in mind a kind of a, of a, so it's a book that should be able to also speak to other, to kids from other backgrounds. So we're trying to get some universal concepts going on, but it is quite, difficult because um yeah I, I felt a certain tension and I don't and I was wondering I've been wondering how much of that came from me and whether I could have been more direct and I just didn't feel comfortable doing that because I wasn't sure what my own parameters were but I think it is difficult I think all of us when we write um there is always um we want to be sensitive to the to the audience and there is there's not always the space. I think there's more space now than there used to be, but there isn't always a space to speak as a Palestinian. And I, you know, I've, I've found that in so many ways, um, but children, the children's literature is a new field for me. So, um, and I know, I mean, I think we probably all know about, you know, the, the controversy that arose with the child, with the alphabet book P is for Palestine. So there's, um, you know, there are issues that come up. There are definitely issues that come up. So, um, we have just another minute or two. Um, Nancy, yeah. do you have a question? Nancy, what? No? Okay. Sorry. And so the final question then is from Leila Taji, who's asking you um, any plans for future children's books? You have, you mentioned the one. Yeah, I've, I've already written a sequel called Nyla Makes Mamu. Um, oh. <laughs> so. Okay. And it's, it's a very simple story. And it's just about, you know, she's making, she, um, she has to take something for the bake sale and there, she wants to take chocolate chip cookies. And her mother says, you know, they want something that we make at home and we don't make, we don't make chocolate chip cookies. And so, um, again, you know, I wanted to make it this whole big thing and you don't really have very much space when you've got just, you know, a set number of words. So that's the next one that's written, but won't be published for a while. And then I think I'm going to try and take a step back and, conceptualize this character in a larger framework. Yeah. And for the teachers in the audience, what is the age group this is perfect for? This is a, like first to fourth grade or? Yeah, around, around third or fourth grade, around third or fourth grade. And the other thing that was quite challenging for me was because one forgets because I don't work with younger audiences so much. Um, and I had to be very careful about my vocabulary in, in the sense of, um, you know, the right level of the words and all of this. So it was quite interesting. I learned a lot by doing this. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's great. 
So, yeah, yeah. Lisa, thank you so much for, for joining us and for reading your wonderful book. We really love having you here. And I, and I know that the time difference is really significant for you and Cypress, our tech team in Ramallah. So thank you for making this happen. It's wonderful, it's wonderful, wonderful to have you here. Thank you. It's wonderful and wonderful to see people. And I'm so glad that the kids were here and I hope you liked the book and I hope you read lots of different books. <laughs> so Great. yeah, okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you everybody for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay, take care. Bye.